this morning, unless you worship the Lord. Um, announcements this morning, um, do we have any visitors this morning? Right up here in the front, we've got a visitor here. Um, Brother Homer, if you will bring me a visitor's card, it's wonderful to have you. Please come. Let's enter into the Lord's presence with us this morning. Amen. Um, Sunday school, we had 47. and 
And I just pray, Lord God, that our worship will be acceptable in you, Lord God. We know most assuredly, Lord God, that we cannot worship you unless we worship you in the spirit and in truth, Lord God. And I pray that each of us will enter into your presence and worship truly. And I pray that all that is done will bring glory and honor to you. We just pray for each need that's been mentioned this morning. We do pray for Dino, Lord God. We pray that this surgery that's going to be done, that it will be successful, Lord God. Give wisdom and give skill to the doctors. We pray for Leah and Aiden, Lord God, that you'll touch some little bodies and heal them. We pray for Reba and we pray for Clayton, Lord God. You just touch them, Lord God, and your perfect will be done in their lives. Just um, completely and totally heal and restore. And we do pray for Mary Ramsey, Lord God, and for her family, Lord God, in this time of loss. We just pray, Lord God, that out of this, Lord God, wonderful things will come, Lord God. That, Heavenly Father, what the enemy means for evil, Lord God, you will bring the forth good out of it, Lord God. And we just pray most of all, once again, that everything that is done in this place will bring glory and honor to you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right. How about birthdays and anniversaries? Did Dee have a birthday? He's not listening, but he had a birthday. We're going to sing to him here in a minute. <laughs> Come on down, Brother D.
understand it's definitely flat. Um, I just wanted to say real quick that last week I had the honor and privilege of taking these youth to uh, camp, and I saw the Holy Spirit working in them. And as you can tell today, that usually when you're doing something right, everything goes wrong because Satan's trying to tear you down. But I would appreciate it if everybody that, that could come tonight and listen to them give their testimony. <clears throat> Of that, we have to live out here on this earth what we are in heaven. 
We cannot just simply say, I am righteous in heaven. I am righteous in God's sight in the heavenlies. Therefore, I can live any way I want to. The Word of God tells us if we live that way, first of all, if that's your attitude, you're probably not saved. But if you are saved and you have that attitude, understand this morning, we're going to see from the Word of God that God does not hear our prayers when we are full of sin and strife and evil things. Amen? Sin hinders prayer. Prayer gives strength to the individual in the church. So often when we start talking about sin, what we do is, is we start looking at the sin in the world, don't we? It is easy to look at the world and say, boy, there are a bunch of sinful people out there. If we could just straighten out the president, we could sit out and straighten out the Congress, and we could straighten out all the leaders, and we could straighten out this group, boy, then we could have revival. Amen? Guess what? The Word of God says we start a little closer to home than that. It's real easy to see the problems in someone else. It's real easy to see what's wrong on this earth and what's wrong in our government and what's wrong in our country. But the Word of God says that it starts a little closer. 1 Peter 4 and 17 says, For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end of them that obey not the gospel of God? Judgment has to begin right here in the house of God. If we want to see revival, we don't need to be praying that it simply happens in our government. We have to start right here, first of all. We have to start with the sin problems in our church before we can start dealing with the sin problems in the world. To see revival, we have to see what's wrong here. But to go even closer than that, Matthew 7 and 3 says, And why beholdest thou the mote in thy brother's eye, but considereth not the beam that is in thine own eye? First cast out the beam of thine own eye. Before I can start judging inside the house of God, I have to judge in myself. How many of you know that the church of God is made up of individual Christians? And for us to get to the point to see true revival, remember we have to pray to God. But before we pray to God, we have to be clean. And it has to start individually. That scripture there says, why are you looking at the beam in your brother's eye, the, the, the speck in your brother's eye? Well, there's a big beam in your eye. We nitpick and we can see what's in someone else's eye. We can see the sin in another's life a lot easier than we can in our own sometimes. Remember, sin hinders communication with God. And nothing of lasting value can be done without God. We can set up programs. We can set up this. We can set up that. And we can organize people, can't we? We can do that real well. But nothing of lasting value will happen unless God steps onto the scene, unless the Holy Spirit moves, and God will not step onto the scene, and the Holy Spirit will not move until we pray, and we pray as the righteous children of God that we are in Christ Jesus. Now I'm going to go through a bunch of scriptures here, and as we go through these, I want you to listen to these. Also, if you want to, you can turn in the Word of God. I believe if you're looking at it, you'll get it into your spirit a lot better. Psalm 66 and 18. I'm going to read this in the King James Version. I'm going to read it in the NIV so we'll see what this one word means better. Psalm 66 and 18 says, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Now let's read it in the NIV. It says, If I have cherished sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. See that word regard? In the NIV it says cherish. It means if I hold sin dear to me, if I love sin, if I hold on to sin, God doesn't hear my prayer. Right. Amen? That doesn't mean if I occasionally sin, God does not hear my prayer. The Word of God says that we all sin, we all come up short, but God has made a means by which, a means by which we can be forgiven of sin. I mean, it says if we come and we ask for forgiveness, God is righteous and He is just and He will forgive us of our sins. But it says here in Psalm 66 and 18, if we hold on to sin, if we love sin, if we cherish sin, we might as well not get down on our knees and pray because God does not hear us. Amen? How about Proverbs 15 and 29? It says, The Lord is far from the wicked, but he heareth the prayer of the righteous. Amen? Proverbs 
Proverbs 28 and 9 says, He that turneth away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer shall be abomination. In the NIV it says, If anyone turns a deaf ear to the law, even his prayers are detestable, hateful, and revolting to God. When you turn to sin and away from God, even when you are a child of God, even your prayers are detestable to God. I'm going to say amen this morning. That's the word of God. This isn't my opinion. <laughs> Isaiah 1 and 15 says, And when you spread forth your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Yea, when you make many prayers, I will not hear your, hand, hear your hands, hear you, because your hands are full of blood, full of sin. Amen? John 9 and 31 says, Now we know that God heareth not sinners, but if any man be a worshiper of God and doeth his will, him he heareth. God hears us when we go sit down and pray when we're allowing God to make us righteous. Amen? Amen? Turn over to Jeremiah 7, 1 through 10. That's a long one, so I didn't write it down. I'll have to turn there too. Jeremiah chapter 7, verses 1 through 10. The word that came from, to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, Stand in the gate of the Lord's house and proclaim there his word. And say, Hear the word of the Lord, all you of Judea that enter into the gates of the work to worship the Lord. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Amend your ways and your doings, and I will cause you to, to dwell in this place. Trust you not in lying words, saying, The temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, for the temple of the Lord are these. For if you thoroughly amend your ways and your doings, if you thoroughly execute judgment between a man and his neighbor, if you oppose not the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow, and shed not innocent blood in this place, neither walk after other gods in your heart, then will I cause you to dwell in this place in the land that I gave to your fathers forever and ever. Behold, you trust in lying words that cannot profit. Will you still murder and commit adultery and swear falsely and burn incense into Baal and walk after other gods whom you know not? Now look very carefully at verse 10. It says, And come and stand before me in the house which is called by my name and say we are delivered to do all these abominations. See what God said there? Do you go out and lie and steal and cheat and do people wrong? Do you do these things? Do you sin and then enter into the house of God and say we want to worship you because we have a right to sin like this? The word of God says the child of God has no right to sin. Amen. Amen? We have no right to go out and live like the world. We are not free to sin. We are free from sin. Amen. We are free to live righteous lives through Christ Jesus is what the word of God says. How dare us come to the altar and kneel down and say, Lord God, I have a right to come into your presence. Even with all this filth and sin in my life, I have a right to kneel before you and ask you this, and I expect you to give it to me. But the word of God says that we are full of sin and filth. When we step down to talk to God, God does not hear us. We can pray for revival till we're blue in the face, till we pass out and can't get up. But if we're full of sin, no revival will come to the house of God. Our sin does not limit God. It limits us. Amen? There has never been a sin that has been committed that has hurt God. That has caused Him not to be able to do something. But it does limit the house of God. It does limit the children of God. Isaiah 59, verses 1 and 2. Isaiah 59, beginning in verse 1. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened, that it cannot save. Neither is ear heavy, that it cannot hear. But your iniquities, your ongoing sin, have separated between you and your God. And your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. Amen. Did you get that this morning? Amen. God's hand is still able to save. Amen. God is still in the saving business this morning. The word of God tells us that Jesus came to this earth, died upon the cross so that souls can be saved. God hasn't changed his mind about that. He's still able to reach down and save the most wretched sinner. Amen. He's able to hear the cries of his people. 
But it says here the reason that he does not save, the reason that he does not hear is because of our iniquities. Because of our ongoing lifestyle of sin is what causes God not to be able to reach down and save. You don't want to know why souls aren't saved in churches today? It's because the people do not take holiness serious enough. Because we do not take righteousness serious enough. We do not understand sometimes, I believe we understand it, but we don't want to grasp it in our minds that when we live in a lifestyle of sin, God does not hear our prayers. So what's the solution? 2 Chronicles 7 and 14, I think we all know this scripture. It says, If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray, and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sins, and will heal, heal their land. Amen. Did you hear that this morning? Our sins cause God not to be able to hear us, but God is so full of grace and mercy, he says, if you will turn from your sins, if you will turn to me, I will hear you. Amen? Amen? Amen. We don't have altars here just because they look good. There are altars here so we can get before the Lord and weep before him over our sins and get to a place that he can answer our prayers. Yes. Hosea chapter 10, verses 12 and 13. We'll read chapter 13 first and then um, um, verse 13 and then 12. Hosea 10 and 12 and 13. Beginning in 13. You have plowed wickedness, you have reaped iniquity. You have eaten the fruit of lies because thou didst trust in the way and the multitude of thy mighty men. Sow to yourselves in righteousness, reap in mercy, break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord till he come and rain righteousness upon you. Did you get that last part there? It says, sow to yourselves in righteousness and reap in mercy. The last part of that says, it is time to seek the Lord until he rains righteousness upon you. This isn't some small thing that you can come to the altar and say, God, forgive me of my sins and get up and go on living the way you want to live. It says here we need to get down at the altar, we need to get serious about this, and we need to stay at the altar and stay in the presence of God until he rains righteousness upon us, until he sends revival. Jesus made a very good point of this when he was telling the parable of the one that would sit and she would go before the king day after day and ask him of something until it got to the point where the king grew weary of her and said, the judge said, I'm tired of hearing from you. But he said, you know what, I'm going to give you what you want because I'm, you're so persistent in what you do. I would tell you this morning, God listens to a persistent heart. He listens to the one that gets serious about getting clean before him, and he will clean us, and he will answer our prayers. Amen. Isaiah chapter 1, verses 18 and 19. Come now and let us reason together, said the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. They, though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. It's not a matter if God will forgive us. It's a matter if we'll come and allow him to forgive us and cleanse us. Amen? Amen? Verse 19 of that says, If you be willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. If you be willing and obedient, you will eat the good of the land. If we as a church, if we as individuals are willing and obedient to repent before God, to turn to him and say, God, cleanse me and purify me, it's not if we're going to eat of the good of the land, it's if we are going to eat of the good of the land. We are going to see revival. We are going to see souls saved. We are going to see the kingdom of God advanced in Miracle Faith Baptist Church. Amen. When we get to that point that we decide we're serious about being righteous, we're serious about being holy. James 4 and 8, the first part of it says, Draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. 1 John 1 and 9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Amen? Amen. The question arises, though, how do we know what sin is in our life? What is hindering us from receiving of God? What is hindering our communication with God? If you don't know it or not, we're going to be talking about this for quite some time, so y'all better get used to it. Our theme for these 
messages is going to be Psalm 139, 23, and 24. It says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. That's how we know if something is sin in our life. You know, we can get real technical with this, and we can go through and we can say, Well, I don't see this as being sin in the Word of God. I see this as being okay. But you don't want to know what? If you get serious with God and you say, God, search me and see what's sin in my life, and He shows you it's sin, guess what? It's sin. Yeah. Amen? Amen? So how do we live in a way that God hears us? Zechariah 4 and 6, the first part says, the second part says, Not by might, not by power, but by thy spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. How do we live a life that is holy? How are we sanctified? It's through the Spirit of God. You're not going to do it in and of yourself. You know, the first part of this message, if we didn't preach the second part of this, it would be a very discouraging message, wouldn't it? If I told you that God will not hear you with sin in your life, with ongoing rebellion in your life, and I didn't tell you the means by which to get it cleaned up, I might as well not preach this sermon this morning. But the Word of God tells us it's not by my might, it's not by my power, but it's by the Spirit of God that things get done. It's by the Spirit of God that I can live a holy, sanctified life. It's by the Spirit of God that I can resist temptation when it comes to me. So that when I kneel down, I can be clean and pure before God. Amen. You know something? We spend way too much time trying to get clean when we get to the altar. Mm -hmm. Amen? We spend about three quarters of our time trying to get to where we can get into the presence of God. Because we're full of filth and stinking things of the world. Wouldn't it be nice if we can kneel down and we can kneel down holy and pure because we've allowed God to live through us all week and we can kneel down and just enter into His presence? Amen? God has made a way not only for us to go to heaven but also to live a life that is pleasing unto Him on this earth. Amen? A lot of people want to get saved and just say, boy, I've got my ticket, I'm okay. That's not enough for me, brothers and sisters. It's not enough for me just to know that I'm going to go to heaven when I die. I want to live a life that is pleasing and beneficial to God while I'm on this earth. Amen. I want to get to heaven and hear God say, well done, good and faithful servant. Amen. Don't you? Amen. Don't you want to hear God say, well done? A lot of us are going to get there and we're going to, God's going to say, you got here by the skin of your teeth how you got here. Amen? Romans 6 and 6 tells us what God has provided for us. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, Christ, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Amen. We do not have to serve sin. We do not have to be in bondage to sin if we do not want to be. Amen? Amen. If you're in bondage of sin, it's either because you're ignorant of the word of God or you choose to be in bondage of sin. When I say that word ignorant, don't take that as I'm being mean to you this morning. Ignorance means you just don't know what the Word of God says. Romans 6 and 14, this is one of my favorite verses in the Word of God. It says, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under Christ. We do not have to carry the burden of sin once we become the children of God. We do not have to be bound up in the things of the world. We can live a righteous, pure life through Christ Jesus. Galatians 2 and 20 says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. If you're trying to live a righteous life in and of yourself, you're going to fail but if you say as Paul does, I am crucified, and it's no longer me who lives, but it's Christ who lives through me. Amen? Amen. Colossians 2 and 6 says, And yet ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk you in him. We have received Christ, but then it becomes our choice if we're going to walk in Christ Jesus. If we're going to just simply say, I'll get there however I get there, or if we say, I'm going to live a victorious life while I'm on this earth. I'm going to live a life that when I walk down the street, people are going to turn and take notice and say, there is a disciple of Jesus Christ. There 
there as a child of God. Romans 8 and 29 says, For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Amen. God has predestinated you to be as Christ Jesus. Amen. We read that Jesus lived a life on this earth from the time he was born to the time he was crucified. Not one sin entered into his life. He lived a perfect life, but it says here that God has predestined you and I to live that same life. To get to that point. We won't get there until we get to heaven. But thank God we can be in the process of getting there here on this earth. Some people are going to get to heaven and it's going to be culture shock. They're going to get there and they're not going to know what to do without the sin in their life. I pray that the day that I die, I'm closer to God. I'm closer to being perfected than I was the day I got saved. Amen? Amen? Amen. 1 Thessalonians 5 and 20 said, 23 says, And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved by blameless until the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. God wants to sanctify his church. God wants to cleanse and make us whole. Jeremiah 29 and 13 says, And you shall seek me and find me when you shall search for me with all your heart. Amen. That's the problem most of the time. We're not searching for God with all of our heart. We're just giving a small percentage of ourselves to God. We come and we kneel down and we say, God, just forgive me. Forgive me, God, just, just forgive me. And then we get up and we live the same way we knelt down. But it says here, if we search for him and seek for him with all of our heart, that means there has to be brokenness. That means there has to be tears flowing. That means there has to be repentance coming from us. Amen? Amen? Amen. God wants to sanctify, cleanse us. He desires for every believer, every church, to be like Christ. Without spot, without wrinkle. You ever read that in the Word of God? It says that Jesus is coming back for a church without spot or wrinkle. Amen? Amen. That doesn't mean there won't be any sin in the church when He comes back. That means He's coming back for a people that are diligently seeking Him. He's coming back for a people that are diligently seeking and desiring to be perfected as He is. Amen? Amen. <coughs> Almost through this morning. Y'all hold hang in for just a minute. That doesn't mean just the outside being clean, but every part of the vessel clean. It's easy sometimes to get those sins that people see out of the way. It's easy. Jesus said, um, you're a bunch of hypocrites. You clean the outside of the vessel, but the inside is full of dead man's bones. The inside is filthy. It's undone. Becca gets kind of upset sometimes when I wash dishes because I can make the outside, the part that didn't have any food in it, look real good. Boy, I, the outside of the pan looks good when I get through. But there's cheese from the macaroni throated in there, and it just looks terrible. You sure don't want to cook in that, do you? <laughs> you get it out, and it's got old dried, crusty food in it. You're like, boy, I'm not going to cook in this vessel. <laughs> the outside looks good. It was deceiving. A lot of Christians are deceiving the world. A lot of the Christians are deceiving their fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. They come and they spit and polish the outside, but the inside is filthy and it's undone. You know what? God doesn't care nearly as much as about the outside as he does the inside. You can kneel down in your three-piece suit before God, and you can look so righteous and pure to the world, but if the inside's dirty, remember what we learned this morning? God does not hear our prayer. But understand this this morning. God's desire and God's plan is to sanctify each and every one of his children to become like Christ Jesus. Y'all ever notice that God always gets his way? Amen? <laughs> Why do we fight against him in this? It'd be kind of silly if we fought him about going to heaven, wouldn't it? But we fight him so much in this thing of holiness and purity. We fight him so much that we don't want to become like Christ, I believe, sometimes. You know a lot why our lives are so miserable sometimes? Because we're fighting against the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives to be sanctified. We're fighting.
fighting against God. God is saying to the church, if you will allow me, I will perfect you to the place that I'll hear your every prayer. If you will allow me, I'll bring revival to the church. But we fight him and we say, no, I want to hold, I want to cherish this sin. I want to cherish and hold this one close to my heart. <clears throat> but the word of God says God will not hear us. Who is that hurting? Is it hurting God or is it hurting us? It's hurting us, isn't it? Yeah. I'm going to read Psalm 139, 23 and 24 again. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any wicked way in me. Lead me in the way everlasting. Over the next few weeks, we're going to look at the Word of God, and we're not just going to look at categories of sin and just kind of say, well, this is sin, this is sin. We're going to get down to the heart of the problem. We're going to get down and we're going to look at what the Word of God says is sin in the believer's life. And I encourage you to come back, but before you come back, I encourage you to make Psalm 139, 23, and 24 the prayer of your heart. And come back next Sunday morning saying, Lord, search me by your word. Search me and see if there's anything in me that's hindering your move in this church. I want to tell you, it's not going to be a comfortable thing to look at sin. Um, I started doing this this week, and I started, I had lots of time in the band to read the word of God. And I started looking at the different categories of sin. Can I tell you, I fall short in all of them. That there is sin in my life in each and every one of them. Now I can cop out and say I'm just human, I'm just flesh, I have to be this way. But we've learned from the word of God that we do not have to be in bondage to sin. And as we look at these categories of sin over the next several weeks, as we look at what God says, this is sin, do not do it. I want to encourage you to open your heart and open yourself up that God can touch you and he can deliver you from that sin. I am more encouraged than I ever have been in this church that God is going to move and there is going to be revival among us. I am encouraged that God is going to reach this community through this church. That God is going to do great and mighty things through this church. I am encouraged that God is going to move and we're going to see things that we've only imagined happen. Amen. That we're going to see people run on these altars and fall down and repent and be saved. But it's only going to happen one way. And that's when we make ourselves available for God to cleanse us. When we get to the point that we're sick and tired of <coughs> sin in our life. Amen. Amen? Amen? I'm going to ask our musicians to come back this morning and lead us in a time, an altar call, and I want to encourage you. If the Word of God has touched your heart this morning, if you realize that there are things in your life that should not be there, things that are hindering the move of God in your life and in this church, you need to find you an altar and get along with God. You need to find you a place and say, God, I repent of this. I know that I cannot change it, but your word promised me that you'll change it through me. If you're not saved this morning, not only will God not hear your prayer, you won't go to heaven. Because not only are you not righteous in how you walk, you're not righteous in God's presence either. <laughs> God looks at you and he sees your filth and your sin is what he sees. If you haven't accepted the finished work of Jesus Christ, he looks upon you and he sees the filth of your sin. First thing you need to do is make that right. <clears throat> you need to come and say, Jesus, forgive me. I accept your finished gift. Let us pray this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Lord God, your word is all proficient, Lord God. It gives us all that we need. Lord God, and I just pray this morning that through the reading of your word, I just pray that hearts will be changed, that hearts will be renewed, Lord God, that we will be a people of God, Lord God, that desire to see you move so much that we will sacrifice, Lord God, the sins of our lives unto you, that we will come, Lord God, and say, Lord God, cleanse me, purify me, and make me whole. I just pray, Lord God, that you will touch this people, Lord God, that we will be a church, Lord God, that is holy and clean in your sight. If there is one lost, 
Lord God, I pray that your convicting fire will fall upon them so strongly that they will not leave till they accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name.
uh, a commitment to God, and once we accept him, um, Satan really gets mad, Amen. and he really fights in, and we're going to pray with them, and um, and then after that, I'm going to have the um, four of them stand up here, and after service, um, y'all come by and shake their hands and tell them how much you love them, you're going to be praying for them, and we're going to pray with them this morning. Heavenly Father, I just thank you for these young people, Lord God. I thank you, Lord God, for the opportunity they had to go to camp and hear your word. And I thank you for each one of them, Lord God, that went and received you as our Lord and Savior. I just pray for Mercedes and for Brandy and just, Lord, for um, each and every one of these children, Lord God. I just pray, Lord God, that you'll just reach down and you'll touch them, Lord God. I just pray, Lord God, that you'll just mightily move, Lord God. And I just pray, Heavenly Father, that you'll just give them the strength, Lord God, to live the life, Lord God, that you have called them to live, Lord God. I just know, Lord God, that you're able to do all things, Lord God. We have learned in your word this morning, you did not just save them that they might go to heaven, but you saved them that they might live a righteous, victorious life upon this earth. And I just pray right now in the name of Jesus that you just reach down and touch each one of them, Lord. And I pray that each one of the children that went to camp this week, Lord God, the things that they have learned, the things that you have um, birthed in their spirits, Lord God, will continue to grow and will just um, um, become mighty things in their lives, Lord God, and that each of them will be mighty, mighty witnesses to you. I just pray for them, and I just seek that you touch them and bless them. In Jesus' name, amen.